Questo So it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Novindu Sabin from Columbia University. He will be talking about the boundary regularity for the non boundary equation. So I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation. So today I want to talk about regularity theory, an overview of the regularity theory for motion pair equations at the right hand time. Equations. So let me just start not time by saying what is motion pair equation. So we we start with a function u Let's say for simplicity to define the unit ball which is convex. Then we reach the problem, and the initial problem for the Monshaka equation is the determinant of u square of u, let's say u is to 1. Let's say u is to spin d1, and u is prescribed on the bottom. Let's say we try to find a function. If you look at the picture, basically so we have the one, we have some bounds that is later time. We basically want to find the function u such that at any point when we look at the Hessian, when we do the product of the eigenvalues, we get one. So it's very important that we look for complex solutions. This is what makes the problem elliptic. Elliptic meaning that there is some comparison principle between the two solutions. Okay, so let's see, how, how can we think about the Mont-Jean-Pair equation? So, I, uh, so let's say I say the Mont-Jean-Pair equation is some sort of a, a fine, so that you find invariant version of Laplace equation. And just to motivate this, uh, let's say, uh, this characterization of one jump equation, then we will start with three basic, let's say, three basic uh, elliptic, elliptic equation, and the first one would be a Laplace equation. So, number one would be Laplace equation. Zero, and this is the linear equation that has an invariant property. One can convert the solution down explicitly. So it's not so interesting. The second one would be, let's say, what if I want to have like a Laplace equation which is invariant under rigid motions? Yeah, so this would be the minimal surface equation. Minimal surface equation. The minimal surface equation says that, of course, you look at the graph, you look at the surface, and you simply want to say that the mean curvature, so let me the trace of the second fundamental form of the graph of the zero. So this is a geometric equation which does not distinguish well, if you have a graph or not, this is invent under rigid motion. So if you take a point and you focus really, really close to this point, you see in the end Laplace equation. Yeah? So if you focus very close to this point, your your solution looks, let's say after you rotate, it looks like a, a plane. So this thing that u identical zero is a solution, the minimum surface equation. If you want to try to understand small variation, if you try to say that u is identically zero, u plus epsilon w is still a solution to the minimal surface equation, what you obtain, you obtain the Laplace on w is to zero. So the linearized equation, let's say the one that says, well, if I have a plane, if I have a precise solution, and I want to look for a perturbed version, for the, for the perturbed solution close to a plane, to the minimal surface equation, you go back to the Laplace equation. So this would be, this is the minimal surface equation would be a, a 
version of Laplace equation, let's say it would be like uh, rigid uh, invariant, let's say rigid motion invariant. Plus equation. Now the third equation is the monetary equation. This is the third equation is the monetary equation, and I say that this is almost this is has some resemblance to the minimal surface, except that now we don't want to use rigid motions. We want to use a fine invariant. So let's see. Let's just see that the Determinant, you see, if you take a function, q is a solution to determine on this square of p to p1, and I take in the finally scaling, you feel that this is u of x, where a is determined to x1. Then when you look at the second derivative, if you feel that this So it just goes this quick way, and the determinant is the same, right? So you tell this to the solution. This is the solution. So now this means the following: that if you take if you take some point here on the graph of u, then you can you can always deform u by the fine values in such a way that your Hessian becomes identity, and you don't change the equation. So you can try to say a very simple solution to the Morgenthal equation is the identity. Let's say the simplest polynomial of this. This is the solution. And then to understand at least what happens when you perturb things a little bit, you want to say, well, what happens if to this solution, one x squared, I add a small perturbation w. How, what does W have to solve such, such, such that this, this is still a solution to the model of that equation up to order epsilon? And then it's like a simple computation, right? But the hashing is basically one determinant of identity plus epsilon this squared W to do this thing as well. So this tells you that the plus of W equals zero. So, so again, the linearized Equation, the linearized equation meaning the perturbed from this nice solution is still a plus equation that appears in the end, but of course the geometry, your, your, your full equation is embedded under a fine transformation. You just have to set it up, you just have to find a, a precise a fine transformation to at a, at a given point to apply so that it's a Laplace equation appears. Okay, so now. Let's see. So, what what I would like to uh, what I would like to discuss is some let's say regularity issues for for uh, Monjamper equation. So we start first with existence. Let's see how does one prove existence? The really problem is let's say it's in general it's very easy provided that you specify what you mean by a solution. So, if you want the solution to be already to have second derivative, then this problem is difficult. Right? So if, you, if you impose that u, you want to solve the problem but such that u is already C2 and, and, and the top line here already makes <coughs> sense in the, in the first point, then the problem is difficult. However, most of the times in elliptic equation, you just relax the problem. Just say, well, uh, maybe I cannot prove that the solutions are C2, but I can still make sense of, of some, some solution. And this is, let's say, what would be a reasonable solution for this problem? I would say, like this that if you, if you have a sequence, so this is not a notion of discussed solution, but let's see how it goes. If, if you have a sequence of classical solutions, so let's say if you have UK, which are C2, let's say, have solutions, and UK would converge uniformly into some, some uses, like a uniform convergence, 
then you want to say that this last thing, this U, is still a reasonable solution. Right? So if you have like a classical solution that gets closer and closer and closer to some limiting configuration, you would still like to say that this is still a solution. Of course, the limit might not have two derivatives. Yeah? So, so if, if one pays a bit more attention to this definition, let's say that the precise, when well, they right here, the when precise you say solution at this point, you just mean the equation, not the boundary condition. Well, the, not the boundary condition, yeah, let, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just saying, what, what do I mean by this, right? So let's say, yeah, exactly, what do I mean by this equality? So I want to relax it, right? So in, in the little equation, what you do, you just have to relax a bit the definition to compactify the space of solutions. And you just obtain the limit by, by, I mean, you just obtain the solution as a limit of, of sum. So just to motivate the definition, well, what, what do I mean by this? Right? What, what I mean by this, I say, if, if they are classical, it's clear what is that. If they are not, well, however, if I have some classical solution that can get closer and closer to a limiting one, which has to be convenient still, I still want to say that this satisfies the same equality in some in some weak sense. And the, to make this, this definition precise, then right here, discuss the solution. solution. So most of the time in elliptic problems, what you have to do, you have to say like this, <coughs> you satisfy, satisfy the determinant of this square of U equals to 1 in, in, in this classical sense, so in this classical sense. If U is continuous, Draw a graph, and let me draw a picture here. So if this is a graph of you, you want to see like this every time, every time it's, it's in color show. So this is just continuous, but you want to see like this every time you can touch the graph of you with some smooth uh, V by a bar, at the contact point you want V to satisfy the inequality. So it's this path is the point at zero. What you want, you want to say that this square of v at x zero, when you compute the determinant of this square of v at x zero, you want it to be greater than or equal to one. And if you touch under it to some w, let's say, which is convex, let's say w convex, you want to satisfy the opposite inequality. Let's say determinant. So this would be the notion of this class of solution. U is just a continuous function, and all you are saying is every time I take polynomial, you can think that V is a polynomial. And I can touch, you don't know if you can touch, but at any point I can touch the graph of you by a bar. It's such a polynomial, the contact point, I want to have this inequality. And the opposite, if I touch something that is convex and touches by below, I want to have the opposite inequality. Yeah. And of course, if you is C2, then clearly this are satisfied, but this definition makes sense for any continuous function. So this would be a notion of this, this notion of solution behaves very well under uniform limits. And so this is something you'd like, but I would say here, you'd like some definition that behaves very well under uniform limits and you somehow led to, to, to this definition for, uh, of solution. So if you have this notion of solution, not a classical, but this notion of solution, then existence is very simple. Existence of solutions. It's just, it's just the Perron's method. Perron's method 
is the same as the existence of harmonic, of harmonic function. Yeah, so, what is Perron's method? You just say, you take the graph phi, yeah, you just start with an extremely, extremely convex function, let's say u0, it's very complex to the point of determining, let's say, this square of u0 is strictly bigger than 1 at all points. And then at any point it's bigger than 1, you just cut a bit from this graph. Right? So you start like this, and then what you make it, like in the neighborhood of a point where it's bigger than 1, you can erase this and just increase this a little bit, and you do that again and again. So you just basically start building a bunch of functions, you're almost like you're doing a flow, it's not a flow, but just replacing the, the solutions with some other function that satisfy all of this inequality. So I said I use a big this little bit of u is the supremo of all, all w that have the property that determine from the square of w that's this bigger than or equal to one and w has the same boundary that But the supremum of such a family will just be continuous. Yeah, so, and, and you make this again, it's easy. Okay. So, so this is the easy part for Monjean Pair. You just prove the existence of a, of a weak solution, if not of a flat solution. Now the most interesting part is to say something more about such a solution. So I'd like to say maybe that such a discussed solution is classical. Classic, classical meaning that has to derivative that one solves the Dirichlet problem. Okay, so so let's take a, let me mention now, now some results. One interesting result is due to Pogorelov in the seventies. Yeah. He provided a singular example to the motion pair equation. So say you cannot always have regularities. You can no regular if this is solution, how the solution. This is not this is not classic in dimension in dimension n equals two. So from the level of he built a solution, uh, he built a solution U of the type Say here, you know, x prime to the power of 2 minus 2 over n, and then here, let's say, some g of xn. So this solution is supposed to be like this. It's supposed to vanish on the xn axis, thinking that this is the xn axis, and the remaining variables, the x prime variables, the remaining n minus 1 variable, is supposed to be simply a power. And then this g is just the multiple of this power. Okay, so somehow if you want to solve the Monjantel equation, you are led to, I mean, maybe, maybe initially here you put an arbitrary power, but then if you try to, for things to, let's say, to come out nice, you are forced to put this power in for this time, and then so that if you want to solve the term of this square of u to be equal to 1, this corresponds to some second order of the for g. For g. But what you can do it, of course, what, what happens here, when do you solve the term of this square of equal to 1, this function it doesn't have two derivatives on the x and axis. Yeah? So what happens here is that on this line, the function here grows like the distance to the axis of 2 minus 2 over n. So, 
you cannot compute the second, let's say, you cannot do the product of the second derivative. So somehow when you sit on the line, some second derivative are infinite in the tangential direction, and another second derivative is zero. Yeah, so what you can try to think that when you sit on the line, you have, you're multiplying infinity with, the, I mean, a lot of infinities with, with, with some zero, and somehow maybe it gets to one. But once you step out of this, you can, you can try to, I mean, you always see infinity, and you try to, to write the equation in this, this sort of equation. So now the question is, is this a solution to the, is this a discussed solution? Is the solution in the sense that I wrote earlier? So it's clear a solution away from the line. Right? Away from the line, it is a solution, but on the line I cannot define the classical sense, but it's still a discussed solution. Why? So I just need to look to see if, if it satisfies this, this definition. If we take something smooth by a bar, let's say if you take something smooth by a bar that touches the solution u at some point, right? If you try to say if you take something smooth and somehow touches the solution at some at some point by a bar, do I still do I satisfy the correct inequality at this point? Of course, if the contact point doesn't it doesn't hit the line, you would be definitely satisfied the correct inequality. The question is what happens when the contact points lie the contact point lies on, on this line. And what, what you need to observe here is that if you, if you take a function that touches you by above, the contact point can never occur on the line. Yeah, because this is supposed to be this is a C2 function. And you can never touch the C2 function this particular solution on the line by above. So, so then you don't need to check the definition when you touch by above. If you try to touch by below, you clearly, so let's say if you have a W that touches this particular solution by below, then clearly the determinant of this scale of W is going to be equal to zero, which is less than or equal to one. Why is zero? Because W is forced to have a second derivative zero because the, the graph of B has, has a lot. So I think that you can easily verify that this is uh, a reasonable solution to the term of this square of equal to one. And in fact, what one can do, you can actually approximate this thing by smooth solutions. Right? So the way to approximate this by smooth solutions is to try to think that you, if you have a sequence of C infinite solution that bend very little along the x and direction and almost keep the same shape in the x and direction and you, you have a sequence of solution that is going to decrease precisely to this configuration. So as I said, this is a reasonable configuration and this means you cannot get a second derivative bound for such solution phi. It's precisely the boundary data of this. You cannot find a classical solution. So this is different with the situation, let's say, of Laplace equation and the minimal surface equation. You cannot have pure interior estimate. So in the case of Laplace equation, you don't care what the boundary data is, what phi is. You always get, let's say, as long as phi is bounded, you always get analytic, uh, analytic solutions inside. And the same also with the minimal surface equation. However, with the, with the Mont Ampere, somehow the regularity of phi on the boundary of one plays a role. You cannot just give completely uh, arbitrary data and, and hope to solve this in the process. But what, what Pogorello means, let's say, he also provides something maybe some, some interior estimate which is another important another important word would be the still for Morello here is the interior C2 estimate in the following situation he said that let's assume that instead of solving uh, the problem on the ball, I solve it on some domain, convex domain omega. I think that omega is convex. If 
but u is zero on the boundary form. So what happens? Well, well, I'll show that if you give me any arbitrary convex domain, it doesn't have to be regular. You can have a bunch of corners and uh, it can be a triangle or anything like that. And you you try to solve on that equation, but somewhere in the interior, every time we, if you stay a bit away from the boundary, then you have some sort of you can bound the second derivative by a constant depending just on the domain and the distance that we and the distance from x to the boundary. So this is more like an, I mean, instead of, here I said, if you give me arbitrary data for the Laplace equation, you get a estimate. The situation here is, maybe if you give me arbitrary data, but you have to impose a Q0 on the boundary of this domain, and somehow this forces the function to be convex inside, you can, you can get something. Okay, so now let me go back to still to the classical Dirichlet problem. Yeah, so still, uh, let me assume, for example, that phi. I still want to solve this problem, but phi is extremely small. Let's say it has kind of this infinity. Can I can I still solve it in the classical set? And this this result here. Yeah. Uh, so the this was done by Krilov independently in the early eighties. By Krilov. And Caparelli Nuremberg Scott. A priori estimate from which the existing follows. So he said, that let's look, for example, at the term of this character. Let me put here a map. Uh, yeah, for, for some discussion, I'll have later on that. On, let's say, on the boundary, on, in, inside of omega, and you describe on the boundary of omega, and let's say that the data is sufficiently small. So I think what they needed is that that has to be maybe C2, phi, C4, and the boundary of omega, C4. So sufficient smoothness. And this is uniformly convex. And what they prove, what they prove is that uh, the C plus the normal field, the boundary, of course, there is always some constant C depending on the data. Does that need to be positive? Uh, which one? Uh, and this F? Oh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So F, yeah, F has to be positive. And also, I didn't say, yeah, I have to have security. Okay, so why? I mean, once you have C12, I estimate you can use the method of continuity. So basically, what I'm going to try to, the way to, to prove existence here would be this thing that you start with. Let's say the, the given solution where they can now, let's say, when phi is constant and the right side is 1, and then you simply start modifying this, uh, the boundary data to, to reach phi, 
And in order to make sure, I mean, locally, you can always do this by the implicit function theorem, as long as you have some C2 bound on you. Uh, and then sort of this estimate here, as long as you have C2 alpha, let's say you use sharp estimate. So as long as the solution of C2 alpha bound for the second root of you, you can always solve this problem locally. And this, this is a purely bound value that you can only solve it, and the second derivative would never, the bit of more, would never be general. So you cannot create a singular. And, uh, okay, so this was an important result. What, what really, I mean, what, what was important in this result was to say that, so, Somehow, and let me just mention a bit how you would achieve this. So, from the boundary data, because you know you on the boundary, somehow you can bound if you sit on the boundary. Just by looking at the boundary data, you can easily bound tangential, pure tangential derivatives. You can tau tau tangential to the boundary. And then you, you can bound these things by a bar and, and, and do a Let's say this, you can bound by a bar. Then you have to work a little bit. You have to work a bit to, to bound the mixed derivatives. So that you can do you some new. Or if you take one tangential and normal, you can also bound this using some barriers. And then you use the equation. And once you have this bound, basically you use the equation. To bound, to bound u nu nu. Okay, so once you bound u nu nu just on the boundary, that's so all one, once you bound just on the boundary, then you can just extend it inside. Then you can just extend it inside because, so, so this is a key, a key property of motion of that equation, let's say the determinant. Or log of the determinant is a concave function. So let me write here concavity. Concavity is the equation. It tells us about that pure second derivatives are subsolutions, whatever that means, it's a subsolution. It turns out that if you can bound this, this pure second derivative on the boundary, just on the boundary, then you can just bound them also, you can extend it inside to some maximum principle. But you can apply this maximum principle only for concave equation. So, in fact, this proof of Trilog and, and Kaplan is not so specific to, to the Morgenthal equation. It, uh, it applies to a lot of concave equation. Yeah, so I wouldn't say it's uh, I mean it applies to all all reasonable concave equation. Um, okay now let me mention something else. On the other hand what one would like to understand one would like to understand some local regularity so And this was done by Caffarelli in the late eighties. Some some better. I mean, these are these are very good uh, estimates, but of course, the point hundred and first you need to to know that the data is regular enough, and that plays a crucial role. And you cannot remove this assumption just because you solve this of this example of level. On the other hand, let's say that we start with, with 
with this with the following situation, it's going to be to start with u being zero on the bound of some domain. Let's say you, you know the determinant. The determinant of this curve u is f. Uh, okay, let's say this is positive. Let's say that this set is not. Uh, so so what, what am I looking here for? Let's say I'm, uh, I get a point on the bottom. Let's say this is the origin. I would like to understand if, if, if I put here a 1 already, the result of Povarello tells me that that second derivatives are bound with the origin. And but I would like to have some sort of shower estimates. I want to say that if f is just older than these, can I conclude, can I conclude that this sort of u at the origin is that U is whole that contains C to alpha in the origin. You have an answer. The data, you need a, it depends on the second derivative of F. Yes, yeah, so I mean here, yeah, it depends on the second derivative of F, but, but it's just the method, right? So, so this is a lot of, this happens a lot in an elliptic equation. You just have to differentiate the equation twice and do some estimates. So it seems that it depends on the second derivative of f, but if you linearize the equation, right, if you think that your, your second derivatives are already bound, and you just look for little perturbations, then you run into shoulder estimates. So, so then you think, well, maybe, I mean, is this optimal? I mean, it's not, you don't expect it to be optimal. Yeah? So, so Caparelli, let's say, he, he has this theory this uh, perturbation results in which you say, well, if you, if you know it for constant, if you have, if you have the benefit of this curve of view, if I know that this constant coefficient equation has uh, C to alpha estimates, then um, I can use somehow this result to, to say that if I can relax it to, to just the C alpha. So the key the key point here, so let's say this is specific just to Mojan equation. I would say this proof here, as I said, applies to a lot of a lot of equations. However, this one takes full advantage of the defining values. So what is key here? Let's say here in, in this proof you just take, let's say, take advantage. So let's take so let's let's imagine you solve some equation and the right side f that is wildly but but eventually you get closer and closer to a point it becomes closer and closer to one. Then so so the idea would be the following that you try to Cut, you cut the, the graph of u with parallel plates. Let's say this is the minimum at the origin, u, u has a minimum, and then you just lift a little bit a distance h from the bottom and you try to cut the graph of u. So these are called the sections. Sections of u are defined, let's say, the section of i h. And it's zero, it means the set where u is equal less than zero plus greater of u is zero plus h. So the section of high date means that if I take some point of zero, I will do a tangent plane, I move the distance h up, and this h would be this shape. This complex set. And what happens is if you now you try to use the fine 
if that's the equation, what happens if you can only three scale and do a fine transformation to your solution in the set? And you can only three scale to a fixed equation. Scale is a fine, is a fine transformation such that this picture becomes something like this. Well, this is the ball of radius one, uh, this, and this is the ball of radius n. And what you use here is the following lemma for convex sets. This is known as Jones lemma. That if you if you have a convex any con any bounded convex set, so if you have this bounded convex set, with non-empty interior, let's say with non-empty interior, you can always find a transformation, a fine transformation, so then there exists. Exists A, a fine linear, a linear map such that B1 includes AK, including BN, where this is the dimension of the space. This is, uh, let's see. No lemma in complex geometry that says that no matter no matter how you choose a convex set K, how, how wide, it cannot be too wide because it's convex. If you try to fit inside, if you try to fit inside the maximal ellipsoid, the ellipsoid of maximal volume inside the set, and you look at the center. And then you multiply this, then when you multiply this ellipsoid to that, when you dilate it by a factor n of the space, it has to include the set. And then you can have an affine transformation that takes this ellipsoid into the unit ball, and the set and the So, so somehow convex sets are not, I mean, they are all the same after an affine transformation in terms of size. They all look like balls. Up to a factor uh, after the fine transformation. So this tells you that when you look at this, when you look at these sections, when you cut here and you look at this section, even if they are very long in one direction, so on, I mean they have to shrink to a point, at some point your right hand side when you're very close to the origin doesn't vary too much. Yeah? So you take you take such a section, you transform it into this to the standard situation, you sort of compactify, in this way you compactify the problem, and here you can apply the results of Pogorelov. of one set is extremely close to, to a cast, and you can sort of get your situation. Yes. But I would say this work, this is the key, <coughs> I say the key point is that you can compactify the problem after an affine transformation. That is the, the key idea. Okay, so now I would like to say something about, about some boundary regularity. So let's say, I mean, you already talked about the visual problem, but I would like to say something about what happens when the, the data is a bit, it's not so nice, like to have three, four derivatives. So let me go a bit back to the Dirichlet problem and to the, to the theorem of Caparelli, uh, Nerkos, Prak, and Krilov, and say, let's look at the situation. So I'm going to give even in 2D, so let's suppose we have in 2D, and I try to solve the equation determinant of this square of u equals 1. Let's say that u in, in B1 plus, so I'm saying that the domain, let's assume that our domain, is flat for simplicity. 
and q equals to phi on the boundary if you want plus intersect with uh, x to bigger than zero. So let's say here my function is value phi. Let's say on the straight line, let me make uh, the origin a jump in the second derivative. So let's say that on x squared to <laughs> zero, phi is supposed to be, let's say, uh, x1 squared x1 is positive and half, or let's say twice, twice x1 squared x1 is So now, what, so, so now the question is, what can you say about uh, u? What can you say about the second derivative of u and the origin? So let's say, let me say, what can you say about the behavior of second derivative near zero? So what is the problem now? The problem is that you don't expect to have SQL alpha anymore. I mean, you just, your boundary data has a jump in the second derivative. Yeah. Once your data has a jump in the second derivative, you'd like to say, how does this jump, if you can understand somehow how this jump uh, influences the solution inside. Yeah. Uh, so it's slightly different than what, what we did before because the whole point before, let's say, in, in the Fischer problem, you always try to get a bound on the second derivatives and try to show that the solution is classical. Here, you, you can no longer get that, but you can still get some information. So what sort of information? So let's say here, because, because the bound that is flat, with x to equal to zero, you can only subtract the tangent plane for u at the origin. So let's, say, so let's also assume here, after subtracting the plane, let's also assume that u at the origin is zero and gradient of u at the origin. I mean, u at the origin is zero, it's clear. But let's say, assume that the gradient of u at the origin is zero after subtracting. So, so, if you try to draw a picture from the side, if I try to draw a picture from the side, what I see, I see like this, that I have some behavior up to the origin, up to here, <coughs> and maybe a solution, and maybe a bit faster, a bit, go slightly faster. So here, let's say I see, U identity U is one on the boundary. Omega. Let's say this is the name omega. Well maybe here instead of writing D1 plus, I can I can write that I have some domain omega and U is constant on the boundary. It's not important. And I have some solution here that, that zero is a tangent plane. So what I would really like to understand is the behavior of the solution that equals to zero. And I say I believe that in fact what you see here zero is supposed to be invariant under certain I mean there is some sort of singularity, but it's supposed to be able to be like a singularity that has some invariant. So what does what what transformation leave the equation in the boundary data invariant? There are two two, two types of transformation. So one of the Quadratics, let's say two let's say quadratic, quadratic scaling. Quadratic scaling simply says if you do u tilde of x is u of r x divided by r squared. This doesn't change the equation, doesn't change the second derivative, but also leaves the boundary they can invent. Another type. The variance is an affine, so let's say another one of the, so this is the one, but that is state. The second one would be like, let's say, some other affine, like a sliding along, sliding like this, along x1 equal to zero. So, you, so if you look at the fine transformations that leave the bottom invariant, basically just take the EN 
とも、とも、ちょっとですね、スライドが動きます。デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デザイン、デ P2 plus some multiple U1. And this is what I call sliding along the x1 direction. So it simply takes this picture into nothing happens to the bottom, you just shift things to the right by some, by some, by some angle. Yeah, it takes this vector to this angle. So this, of course, preserves the equation, is the term in this one, but also preserves the boundary there. So what, what you try to think that happens here is some sort of picture that is invariant on, on the code scale. Yeah, so so if, if, if you believe that this is the case, then in this picture you try to understand, let's say, the, the sections. Yeah, so you say just, in, just as, as in the interior case, one, I mean, <coughs> basically to understand the second derivative <coughs> point, is the same as trying to cut with the tangent line and look at the shape of, of the section. Yeah, so when you want to get closer and closer and closer to a point, if you understand the geometry of this section, you still understand precisely it's a geometric way of understanding the second group. So now the question is how do the sections look in this case? So the way the sections are supposed to look in this case, if I draw a picture, you sort of know their shape. You know how they intersect. Let's say if I look at the SH, I know that to the right it intersects the square root of the square root of H, and to the left it intersects the square root of H divided by two. But then in their convex sets. And then okay, maybe I should draw. <laughs> So if you believe that this solution very close to the origin has some self-similar behavior, then you are going to pull in that actually what happens to your sections? Well, your sections are going to start looking like this. They're going to look like this. And then you look more down. They're going to look more like this and more like this. So what, what happens to what, what happens to your section? To the section as age, they can we obtain one from the other by a scaling, but also by a sliding. Yeah, so, so, so you think the original, the original section would look almost like B1 plus, like this. In the origin, and the next one would, would look a bit like this, and the next one, they start. So, of course, they are shrinking, but they are also tilting to the right each time at a fixed angle. So each time I take, let's say, half the section, half the section, half the section, I see the volume is the same as the volume as it, as the unit, as of the unit ball, but each time that is like composed with a slide. So this is, this is important. Why is it important if you can prove such a picture? If one can prove such a picture, like I show here, this is very important because it would Bring you back to a compactness situation like in the interior case. Yeah, so in the interior case, no matter how this convex looks like, you can always apply the final transformation and make it look like a ball. On the boundary case, you have to be more careful. Yeah, on the boundary case, what can happen? So what can happen with the section? Because you know the boundary data, you know what the section hits the bar. Yeah. So what can happen, it can, it can look very much like this. And then maybe when you cut a little bit closer, it can be very, very tiny into the bar. So somehow, when you are on the boundary, if you try to compactify, you also have to take, an, let's say, I mean, this is this, if you try to make this section, like, like, to look like a ball, 
that is very important what happens to your boundary data. Right? So if your boundary, I mean, if, if this is the section of the boundary data and this is what happens inside, somehow, uh, I mean, you, you would really like to rule out whether such a picture is possible or not. So, so this, this is something that I managed to do. So let's say I, I managed to show that, that if you have some maybe you can write this in sort of uh, oh, we're almost at the end. So it's almost uh, time to finish, right? Yeah, okay. I mean, this time, okay. Okay, so let me just write the uh, uh, right theorem. Again, that if we have, if we're in this situation, that we look in the term of this curfew, it is to f, which is in between two constants, let's say f, it just has to be in every infinity, right here. Positive now is below. And U is separates quadratically, let's say U is zero is zero and then of U of Z equal to zero and phi separates quadratically on the boundary, let's say lambda uh, x prime squared. Then what one can show is that SH, the sections of U, after an affine transformation, so it's right here, that there exists A slide such that HH is equivalent, equivalent to a half ball. And this provides, I mean, this gives you compactness, this sort of result, and then you can do, I mean, then you can prove uh, a lot of better estimates at the boundary. Yeah, I, I just wanted to mention that in the interior, you have this for free from John Slema on the boundary, it's not, it's not something obvious. One, one needs to, to work hard to, to prove such a result. Okay, so I'll stop here.